17th uh, annual Satchmo Summerfest, presented uh, presented by Chevron, of course, who, as you know, their logo is a Chevron. Uh, it's true. Um, also, uh, we want to thank the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation, the Joseph and Inez Eichenbaum Foundation, represented here by Stephen Maitland-Lewis and Joni Berry, Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, the Midlow Center at UNO, Harris, New Orleans, Richie, uh, Richard, uh, Richie and Vicki Norigian, the Fertel Foundation, and Bevelo Gas and Electric Lights. Um, I want to also thank uh, Fred Kasten for putting together such a great program for us. I will remind you to turn off your cell phones. Uh, some of you have very embarrassing ringtones, and we don't want to feel bad for you when that happens. Now, to talk about uh, Swing Era Pops Revisited, uh, you might recognize him from last year where he did a lovely presentation on Lewis Russell. I, I will tell you, he has a lovely wife. You just met her, Catherine Russell. Um, uh, uh, he has been a musician, a songwriter, producer, uh, writer, music publisher. Um, Paul Kahn has represented to, uh, to the local angle, Buckwheat Zydeco and Clarence Gatemouth Brown, among others. Um, he is an award-winning uh, uh, he won the W.C. Handy Award uh, as Agent Manager of the Year. He contributed to the book Such Sweet Thunder, uh, Views on Black American Music, uh, among others, C.J. Chenier, Eddie Clearwater, and Holmes Brothers, and his wife have recorded his songs. And after all that, he has gone back to school and is now in the master's program in jazz history at Rutgers University, um, where he has found some amazing stuff he is going to uh, reveal now for the first time, to be heard for the first time in public, not out of a Bakelite radio. So I give you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Kahn. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is this, is this working okay? Okay. Is it possible that these lights can be, you don't really need to see me that brightly? Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. So greetings and uh, salutations, and uh, we're celebrating many things this weekend, and today is Louis Armstrong's birthday, for one. Tomorrow is Louis Russell's birthday, and my 13th wedding anniversary to the in incredible and amazing Catherine Russell. So uh, um, a, a bit of a story, we met in the year 2000, and um, of course I was, I was charmed by the, this amazing spirit from the get-go, but maybe we, I had known Catherine for a couple of weeks and we went to have coffee, and she said, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what to record for my first CD with a guy named Earl May. And uh, I know one thing I'll do is, is Back at Town Blues that uh, my dad recorded with Louis Armstrong. So after spilling my coffee, <laughs> I, I realized that she had me from, not hello, but from Louis Armstrong. <laughs> so once again, um, Satchmo brings people together and in the service of love, it's a beautiful thing. That's all I can say. <laughs> so I'm going to talk and spin some music for you related to swing era Louis Armstrong. So my perspective in coming at this um, is that I, I have worked for most of my career in the music business as a manager and a booking agent. And so when I went back to study jazz history, I kind of filtered things through that lens and thought about things in, in, in that context. So starting out in 1935, Louis Armstrong goes, this is the beginning of this, the swing era, he goes through a couple of major transitions. Number one, he hooks up with a manager named Joe Glazer and 
number two, he's without an orchestra at this point, and Joe Glazer s signs the Lewis Russell Orchestra, one of the top swing bands in New York City, to become Louis Armstrong's orchestra. There's a bit of a backstory to, to this. Actually, Joe Glazer was negotiating with Teddy Hill and um, was about to consummate hiring Teddy Hill's orchestra, and then Teddy Hill found out he'd have to give up his name, and he kind of balked and backed out. And the same thing happened with Willie Bryant, another black orchestra leader. And so last year when I was thinking about this, well, so Lewis Russell agreed to give up. He had been leading this successful big band for seven years or so in New York City, and he he gave up his, his name in the billing, and now it was going to be the Lewis Armstrong Orchestra with Lewis Russell on piano. Why did he do that? Was it a Faustian bargain he made with the devil, Joe Glazer? Um, <laughs> or was, was there another reason? And I, he, he didn't tell us this exactly, but I kind of figured it out. The reason he did it was because he knew how great Lewis Armstrong was, and he loved Lewis Ar Armstrong. The two of them were like kindred spirits, and he was also a, a practical guy, and it was a career move. He, he had been touring all over the country, except he had never been to the West Coast. He had never done certain things. So in a way, this was a step forward for Lewis Russell, as well as the fact that he was working with someone they had recorded together in 1929 and 1930, and Lewis Russell knew that Lewis Armstrong was the I won't use the word. So the next thing that um, Joe Glazer does is he signs Louis Armstrong to Decca Records. And there ensues, you know, a decade of recordings, studio recordings. And I'm going to play for you now um, his recording in December of 1935 with the Lewis Russell Orchestra of Solitude by Duke Ellington. And just a <coughs> couple of things that I think are interesting. The, the Lewis Russell band kind of, their, their concept of rhythm, they, they swing, but it's kind of a percolating thing that happens either on slow numbers or, fa it's always danceable, but it, it's not just a straight 4-4 four, four thing, it kind of percolates. So listen to Pops some great piano backgrounds, Duke Ellington's Solitude.
so as I um, started doing research, not at Rutgers University, but just using Google or whatever, trying to find out about you know, Louis Armstrong and Louis Russell in the swing era, the first things that I ran across gave me the distinct impression that jazz history had come to some wrong conclusions. And one of those conclusions was that this was the worst band of Louis Armstrong's career that was pr pretty much out there. Um, a biographer, Lawrence Burgreen, uh, wrote in his biography, um, Louis Armstrong, An Extravagant Life. Most critics said this was the worst Louis band Louis Armstrong ever fronted, and his years with Louis Russell, which covered most of the 30s, represented the nadir of his career. Did that last track sound like that? <laughs> I, I don't know. Then Albert McCarthy, the British um, jazz writer and critic who published a coffee table book, Big Band Jazz. He wrote, when Armstrong started recording for Decca in the autumn of 1935, his regular band was Lewis Russell's, but it bore little relationship to the superb Russell band of 1929-30, and on record sounded worse than mediocre. And then later on he talks about, I mean, I mean so this is, this is what, what we're talking about, the swing era, a lot of the histories don't even consider Louis Armstrong as being a major figure in the swing era. And that kind of didn't, didn't seem right. And, I, and then I started doing more research. And we come to Joe Glazer. Uh, basically, what Joe Glazer did was to create a table with four legs that was, was Armstrong's career in the swing era. One leg was recordings for DECA. Another was Hollywood, Hollywood films. Third was radio. And the fourth was touring and constantly performing. So he, he, Joe Glazer made this collage. And you know he references Louis Armstrong breaks all box office records. He was commercially very successful. This was in 1936. He, he, he was kind of bouncing back and forth. He'd go to Hollywood, he'll, he'd have a role like in Artists and Models. He did a, a number with Martha Ray. The, you can find these on YouTube. Public Melody Number One. And in, in most of his film role, roles in this period, he, he basically plays a trumpet player, a musician, um, has little acting bits, but he does this b big musical number with, with Martha Ray, public melody number one. Then he goes into Decca, he does a studio version of it, they release it. Every day's a holiday with Mae West. He, he's leading a, a parade playing Jubilee, the Hoagy Carmichael tune. Then he records a studio version, they put that out. Penny's from Heaven, Bing Crosby. He does a song, The Skeleton, the skeleton in the closet, goes in the studio, cuts that. Then he's going on the radio, pl playing the tunes, plugging them. And he, so when he goes out on, and tours, he has huge audiences. Like 17,000 people come to see him in Boston in early 1936 when he's just st starting to tour with this, this new swing era band. And this, this is happening all over. So he, he, he breaks Benny Goodman's attendance record at the Paramount, on and on. So the other thing that happens is he, he's making breakthroughs that jazz artists haven't done before. He gets on a national radio show. Fleischmann's Yeast is the sponsor. Rudy Valley had to take a break. So in 1937, Louis Armstrong, every Friday is for, for two months in April and May of 1937, he's out on the airwaves nationwide. And you can get a, an idea from listening to the, this next selection, he, what, what he sounded like. You might recognize the tune.
singing to you and we're swinging. I've got rhythm, yes, sir. So a, a great surprise um, in, in the audience is a, an old friend and, and colleague of mine uh, named Jim Bateman, who's based up in Bogalo Bogalooza, Louisiana. And for 20 years, I booked Clarence Gatemouth Brown and, and Jim managed Gatemouth Brown. We also worked together on, on Chris Thomas King when he was in the film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And it made me think about how you, you know, you get in a movie, and it, it does amazing things for your, your records and your personal appearances. Joe Glazer invented all of that. So the other thing about an artist and, and, and a manager is you succeed when, when you work well together. And Jim had a relationship with Gatemouth Brown. Uh, it was a handshake, and it was trust. Same with Pops and Joe Glazer. So they really were able to accomplish a lot. And, and the, 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 other, the other skeleton in the closet now is the next part of this. The skeleton in the closet for us was Catherine's father, Lewis Russell, saved a lot of stuff. And we just recently pulled out some recordings that were aluminum discs. We lose that. Okay. So the um, back to the skeleton in the closet. We found a whole bunch of recordings, and there there were what I thought were three aluminum discs in some paper, no marking, nothing on them. It just said Armstrong. So. Over the last few months, we finally got around. I took these to the master of audio restoration who's based in Brooklyn, a guy named Doug Pomeroy. He, he gave me this photo. And this, this shows an embossing tool. So basically, the, the recording was made directly. It cut right into the aluminum. And then you could play it right back. It wasn't something like you're creating a master that could be reproduced. It was just a kind of primitive form of live recording. So here's the discs. We found three, three of these. I brought them into Doug Pomeroy, because to play them back, you need a specialized needle. And he has like hundreds of specialized needles. Have to be the right size. And so he said, I, I went home, and he, he emailed me. He said, you know those aluminum Armstrong discs that you gave me, there are three. Well, one of them seemed too thick. They were two stuck together. So there were four. And so he said, you know, the, 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 I guess the good news and the bad news, you know, I'm, I'm transferring them, and you'll hear some stuff. 
But I, I guess Lewis Russell really liked them. He played them a lot. They're kind of worn in there. Also, the, the person who recorded them, his technique was kind of questionable. So I'm going to take you now to Chicago in 1938. Lewis Armstrong has just come back to Chicago from Hollywood. And, there, and there's a, a headline in the Chicago Defender, the top African-American newspaper, the National Edition, which is that, you know, S Satchmo, th this was a review of, 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 the, of the concert, but he, he basically came back and played the Grand Terrace, which was a, a, a black and tan venue in the, in the south side of Chicago, Bronzeville, the kind of equivalent of Harlem in Chicago. And he, he comes back triumphantly and plays for six weeks, and there are broadcasts of these performances that, lo and behold, were on these aluminum discs. And so the review, Old Satchmo, the Happy Genius, came through with a peach of a premiere at Ed Fox's Grand Terrace Cafe Friday night with a full house of mixed patrons, mostly in formal attire. And then he goes on to praise Lewis. But the thing that's interesting is at the end he talks about some of the repertoire. Uh, the, the first group of songs played by the band was Jammin', My Cabin of Dreams, Ida, Confessing. So it's a mix of what might have been popular by other swing bands in 1937, like Blossoms on Broadway, songs you don't hear of today, with some of the uh, Hot Fives, Hot Sevens re repertoire, Muskrat Ramble, um, Rocking Chair, which was a Hoagy Carmichael tune, where actually that was recorded um, back in either 1929 or 1930 in New York. And in that case, Satchmo integrated in reverse because he, with the Lewis Russell Orchestra, recorded Rocking Chair and had Hoagy Carmichael come in and do a vocal duet with him, which may have been the first recorded vocal duet of, of a black person and a white person, perhaps. So the first song, Jammin', on this list, I had never heard of. We couldn't find it in any discographies. So again, the Grand Terrace, here's the, here's the broadcast, and they play a tune called Jammin'. Now, if anyone knows the origin of the tune or who wrote it or anything about it, let me know. This is a, kind of an intro. And you'll hear the repartee between the announcer and Fox. the trumpet king of swing, Louis Armstrong. Well, it's sleepy time down south, ladies and gentlemen. It's never sleepy time here at the New Grand Terrace Cafe on the south side of the city of Chicago. As the National Broadcasting Company takes you there for the music of Louis Armstrong, old Sat Mo Armstrong and his orchestra. Before going on with our dancing program, Louis, how about dropping that stuff and coming over here and say hello here? Now, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Don't you notice know old Sat Mo getting ready to swing? Yeah, man. Tell them about that voice on that box. Well, there's not a whole lot to tell about it, Louis, but at the same time, it's just a one-word title, but when it's put the arm a strong touch to it, it's jamming. Swing them jazz there, boy. <laughs>
Wow. Um, anyone ever heard that tune before? Okay, Ricky. <laughs> So as I was saying, the, <laughs> the, the repertoire included songs that were, you know, current by other bands, white bands, black bands. So the next one, now, th these transfers are exactly from beginning to end what's on the disc. So in, like in that case, it just f fell out before the end of the tune, but you heard, you know, incredible choruses on the trumpet, and you know that's Louis Armstrong because you know, the tone, the rhythmic attack, the, the harmonic and melodic ideas are all there, and he's at peak form. The next uh, aluminum disc starts at the end of a song and then goes into um, a song that w appeared on two of the different discs, and on this one they don't introduce it, but on the other one, the, the announcer and, and Pops have it back and forth, and, and so now we're going to play one that's called, you know, you know one world word title is called Riffs. Uh, had to do a little research to figure out that Riffs was actually a tune written by Mary Lou Williams called Dunkin' a Donut, um, and recorded by Andy Kirk. And so this, this next aluminum disc has a, a bit of that tune, which has some really great stuff in it, and then followed by a tune called Mr. Ghost Goes to Town, which was another swing era minor, minor classic. The, the, the great thing is that th these are, th this repertoire, Louis Armstrong never recorded. So we get to hear it live from the Grand Terrace in Chicago. <laughs> This is Dunkin' a Donut. the broadcasting company from the new Grand Terrace and the south side of the city of Chicago. But it's time now to quit this slow swinging, Louis. How about some real hot stuff, huh? Mr. Ghost goes to town. So does Armstrong. Thank you. 
So, you know, Armstrong is like a cheerleader for the musicians in the band. And, you know, he's he's calling out, you know, play it, Brother Red. And on other recordings, he's like, you know, Brother Higginbotham, Brother Bacon. You know, he's, he's cheering for, for the, the soloists in his band. And it was an amazing band. I mean, Lewis Russell Orchestra, he, he brought in three great soloists, Henry Red Allen on trumpet, J.C. Higginbotham on trombone, Charlie Holmes, who he said, Charlie, play it sitting, standing up, play it sitting down. Charlie Holmes on, on saxophone, and Albert Nicholas on clarinet. And the rhythm section, Pops Foster on bass, Paul Barberin on drums, and, and Louis Russell on piano. Louis Russell and Paul Barberin and Albert Nicholas started working together in New Orleans in 1922. And, and continued on in Chicago and New York. So, you know, Satchmo loved this band, and he wrote about it in his autobiography, Swing That Music, in 1936. He said, this, these guys were great, the, the best. I was happy to play with them. Maybe he, he was self-promoting that. But when he was, in 1970, when he was recovering from heart ailments, he wrote an open letter to his fans in which he... Thought, thought back about highlights of his career and out of nowhere it was like yeah I mean working with Bojangles Bill and Lewis Russell and the, the Lewis Russell Orchestra being on the radio meeting uh, Lucille these were the things that came to his mind so he, he really he really loved this this orchestra and I think listening to this you, you, you can hear perhaps why so talk just a bit about arranging in the swing era. Chappie Willett was brought in to arrange for Armstrong by Lewis Russell. And he was a top arranger for m many bands, uh, Paul Whiteman, Gene Krupa. But he did a lot of work with Lewis Armstrong in the swing era. And um, a book was published last year called Blue Rhythm Fantasy. And, you know, the idea of what made the swing era, you think of Glenn Miller, In the Mood, Benny Goodman, songs that are based around riffs and, and arrangements, and, and sometimes instrumental. So in some ways, Armstrong didn't really fit the mold because his orchestra was featuring his vocals and his trumpet, and the, the backgrounds had to kind of support that. But at the same time, these radio broadcasts show that he also was doing, you know, incredible riff-based arrangements of instrumentals. And the title of this book, Blue, Blue Rhythm Fantasy, was a song that Chappie Willett arranged and wrote. And John Riggle um, found that Armstrong was performing this starting in 1936, but we had never heard him record it until Grand Terrace, 1938 in Chicago. And this is a, a really kind of advanced piece in composition and arrangement, and there's a great trumpet solo, but it's not by Louis Armstrong. 
It's by Henry Red Allen. And you can recognize the different styles, but also you hear Armstrong going, oh yeah, while the, the trumpet solo is going on. So it's like, okay, here it is, Blue Rhythm Fantasy, enjoy this. Not, not quite starting yet. Yay, Mary, the trumpet king of swing, Louis Armstrong and his music. And now we're changing our pennies for a bit of rhythm. A bristle, bristle, a bristle, 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 fantasy. A lot of horn tooting in that number, Blue Rhythm Fantasy. And now with that definite arm strong touch, here's an old melody. Swing it, boy. Swing it, boy. Swing it, boy. As I said, totally unedited, but uh, worth hearing, I, I, I say nonetheless. Now, in the interest of time, here's another photo of the uh, aluminum disc. Um, I, ha I had a version of of, of uh, Heartful of Rhythm, but since that that's also been recorded previously, 
um, both in the studio and on the Fleischmann's Yeast. I'm going to skip over that. And this is just a graphic of how, what, the, what kind of incredible sets Armstrong had in, in, this, in this period. Particularly, I note the very dark black Nubian goddess over, the, over Paul Barberin's head, who's kind of dancing and, uh, and seducing. And the kind of African kings that might be a caricature of, of Satchmo's face, I, I don't know, but it's, they, they, they didn't spare very much. I mean, when, when you think of Miles Davis, you know, putting you know, black faces on his album covers, uh, uh, Nefertiti or whatever, Armstrong was doing this you know, in the 30s with, with the, you know, n not, not candy coating anything. So in Downbeat has a feature in March of 1938, Satchel Mouth, symbol of best Negro music, has been idol of swing music disciples for many years, the first king of swing. And, uh, you know, th this is, you know, I could spend a, a whole th period on this article, but Now we have a vocalist, Sonny Woods, who Lewis Russell brought along with him. Here's Chappie Willett um, with his recording gear. Chappie also did, you know, location recording. And um, so one more thing we found in the closet, Chappie Willett Recording Studios, 78, Sonny Woods and Armstrong Orchestra. And I wanted to just play this for you because Sonny Woods was hardly ever recorded and he still he worked for, 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 for years. I'd say this, this is an example of someone who uh, sounds classically trained, classically trained tenor uh, singing in the jazz and blues style, which is something that we used to hear in the African American community a lot. And these days, you don't hear this quality and style anymore. There are some, a few college students that I've heard lately uh, sing in this style, so it gives me hope. Uh, and, you know, it's a reminder also of opera singers that uh, when they gave recitals, uh, African American opera singers, when they gave recitals, at the end of their recitals, they would always sing Negro spirituals. So this is um, kind of in that. Tradition. It's inc it's an incredible vocal. Sonny Woods, a radio broadcast with the Armstrong Orchestra, 1939, recorded by Chappie Willett. Things lilacs in the rain and melancholy lullaby. <laughs> April sprinkled her dream. 
from the late musical Swing in a Dream, which in a dream, which in a dream. <laughs> what happened to him? We don't know. We don't know. Sonny Woods, an incredible singer, and always got good reviews. And it, it, it's nice that something survived of him recording, uh, performing on, on the radio. So I'm going to conclude with um, th the last recording that Louis Russell made with Louis Armstrong, and it was a movie shot from a film called Jam Session, and I'll just let it speak for itself. It, it kind of says it all. Now, about this story. I see a light frothy something. Boy and girl, romance, a little comedy, and lots of music. Entertainment without problem. Exactly. That's what the public wants today. Are you using any special bands? Eight of them. The best that are available. Louis Armstrong's already been shot. I want you to see the film. I swore off smoking last week. Come on, Marty. Okay, Martin. Let's have Louis Armstrong. thing I've plenty of baby dream a while scheme a while you should find oh happiness and I guess all those things you crying for baby gee I'd like to see you looking swell baby diamond presents Woolworth doesn't sell. Oh, baby, do do. Tell that lucky day you know darn well, baby. I can't give you a thing but Thank you all so much. Just a couple of really quick uh, commercial announcements. Um, the the uh, complete Louis Armstrong Decca recordings, 1935 to 1946, was issued as a mosaic box set with Grammy-winning liner notes by Dan Morgenstern. It's an amazing package. It's 
It sold out. There were 10,000 copies pressed. But due to popular demand, it is now back in print. So go to the Mosaic website and get yourself a copy. And those same tracks are being released digitally as singles to today, <laughs> courtesy of Ricky Leaks. <laughs> and one final note, I would have played for you a soundie from this era, which I love, uh, called Swinging on Nothing, but Maxine uh, Gordon will play that in her presentation, so be sure to catch her presentation on Velma Middleton. Once again, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Kahn. I love Ricky Leakes. So we're gonna just uh, re-imagine uh, the stage for a moment and- uh, Thanks, Andy. Uh, Thank you. Gary Giddens Such a pleasure me. having you again. With me. Thank you very much. Once again, Paul Kahn. And we look forward to reading your master's thesis as a book. Soon. <laughs>